uh, general picture of each book. Uh, sometimes we, most of the time we go verse by verse. It's like walking into the forest and examining every tree, every leaf, everything involved. Uh, but when you stand away from the forest, and then you can see the overall picture. And so you get the overall theme of Romans. The overall theme of Romans is uh, salvation uh, by grace through faith. In other words, justification by faith. So there's a picture of salvation. After that, you have a baby Christian. That will be 1 Corinthians. That's what that was written to. Often what happens uh, for a new convert, especially if they get saved uh, later in life, uh, they'll be uh, excited about their newfound faith, and so they will uh, tend to be more vocal for the Lord. And so often they'll entertain thoughts of the ministry uh, because the Lord often gives them first fruits. And that's what Second Corinthians is about. Now, when you read through Second Corinthians, uh, the Bible has a different technique in order to tell people or Christians about the ministry than fundamentalists do, or funny mentalists, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, usually, uh, what preachers will do is they'll talk, talk about all the victories. Uh, in the ministry and they'll talk about the great things of the mission field this that and this and they never or rarely if ever say anything about what the ministry is really about it's a dog eat dog people are going to hate your guts your worst enemy is going to be Baptist preachers amen missionary in the Ukraine <laughs> you name it that's the way it is your own soldiers are going to shoot each other we don't need the devil. We got the brethren. And that's how it works. Okay, and that's just the, tr the sad fact of it. And the thing is, is uh, you just stay true to the Lord because every man is going to give an account of himself. Now, that's the ministry. And I dare say one reason why uh, you'll find young people want to get in what's called a full-time ministry and go to the mission field, come back home after the first term, if they make it through that much, never go back is because they're not told the reality of the, mis of the mission field. They're not told the reality of uh, the uh, ministry. And if God calls you to that, it's a great thing, and uh, it's a joy to serve the Lord, but also you're going to have uh, times, if you're going to be like Jesus Christ, you're going to have a Judas. You know, this common thing, what would Jesus do? WWJD, what would Jesus do? I always thought that was something about John Deere, WWJD. Uh, but uh, what would Jesus do? Well, he had a Judas. And so you're going to have, uh, in the ministry, you're going to have somebody that you trusted that's going to hurt you bad. And that's part of the ministry. Now, another thing in the ministry is that you're going to see is that... <coughs> The next book, Galatians, helps overcome something in the ministry is that often uh, preachers want to make sure that their work looks real sweet and kind and holy and spiritual and all this stuff. So they'll develop a list of belief systems that if you believe this, you're holy, and if you don't, you're not. And that's what Galatians is all about. Galatians, Romans and Galatians were two of the favorite books of Martin Luther. And Romans shows that justification is by grace through faith. And Galatians shows that sanctification is also by grace through faith. And I'm one for that all we do is just keep preaching the Word of God, keep aiming at people's heart, keep aiming at their heart, and the outward standards convictions will come as a result of their own love for Jesus Christ rather than, well, this is what everybody's doing. And use peer pressure to help do right. You want people to do right because they love the Lord. Okay, and so 2 Corinthians on the reference Bible. I got two paragraphs at the top. It shows that um, 2 Corinthians, the theme of the book is a the ministry. There are a couple books in the Old Testament, if you look at them spiritually speaking, not doctrinally, but spiritually. Ezra and Nehemiah provide some practical instructions for the ministry also. Ezra and Nehemiah, building a work for God. 
Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is commonly known, uh, the phrase that they use in the colleges uh, for Ecclesiastes is homiletics. Uh, and that is how to deliver a message. In Ecclesiastes, that's what it's written about. Ecclesiastes is uh, the word preacher is found seven times in Ecclesiastes, and it is an example of how to deliver a message. So you can forget homiletics, just read Ecclesiastes and find out how the preacher does it in the Bible. Now, also in America, there's a difference between uh, a ministry and what's called uh, a religious corporation. And uh, most churches today, they will operate their churches according to corporations. They'll have a, uh, you know, they'll follow, like in corporations, they'll follow the uh, financial sheet for this quarter and then this quarter and then this quarter and then this quarter. And uh, the churches have done the same thing today where they'll follow the attendance schedule for this quarter and then this quarter and then this quarter. And that's where they determine their success or failure. If you get around somebody like that, the Bible tells you to do something. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 6. If numbers is a matter of success or failure, the Pope's got them all beat. And if people really are concerned about getting a crowd, it's pretty easy to get a crowd if you have a beer bash. Is that the crowd you want to reach? Okay, have a beer bash. <laughs> Okay, so if somebody says that the numbers are going up, you're right with God. If the numbers are going down, you're not right with God. 1 Timothy 6, verse 5. It says, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt mind and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. Uh, Stephen was just as successful for the Lord Jesus as Peter was. In Acts 2, Peter saw 3,000 saved. St Stephen probably caught 3,000 rocks. Both were successful. Both were men filled with faith. Both, both fulfilled their ministry. And so it's different for all occasions as far as the Lord's leading. Now, the ministry in the Bible involves uh, tremendous sacrifices of an experienced soldier of Jesus Christ. You need to have a tough hide but a tender heart. But in the Bible, the ministry is likened to carpentry, farming, fishing, husbandry, ranching, sheep herding, and military. When Elijah was looking for a replacement, he didn't go to the local Christian college. He didn't go to the local seminary. He went to the back 40 and found a country boy who was plowing. That's who he was looking for. And he found a fellow named Elisha when Elijah was looking for a replacement. When the Lord was looking for some uh, disciples, the first four that he assigned or called were commercial fishermen, common, ordinary men. And that's who heard Jesus gladly. And so we need to understand these things. Amos was a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Many of the men in the Old Testament were shepherds. And then you'll have uh, the rare breed would be the Apostle Paul, who was a well-educated man, a well-trained man. Uh, and then he turned into tent making. Uh, Moses was well-trained in the school of Alexandria, and the Lord had to put him on the backside of the desert for 40 years to work that out of his system. And Moses was a military leader is what he was. He brought the armies of Israel out of Egypt. So that's a part of the ministry. The ministry, uh, the Lord often chooses men from these professions because they understand the common man. And well, what a lot of preachers need to do is they need to get out of their air-conditioned offices and go in the backyard and dig in the dirt. Walk around barefoot. You know, that's what they need to do. Find out what life's all about. And some of them become Protestant popes. I was talking to uh, Brother Robertson up in Fairbanks, and Brother Dan had to deal with one of these Protestant popes up there in Fairbanks. And you talk about a, a, a mess, you know, as far as this goes. You want to hear his testimony on that, how preachers deal with people when they don't like them or if they don't like the company they keep. <laughs> it's, it's a sad thing. It's just amazing what's going on in our country. We don't, preachers just don't have grace. 
You know, if you're not in my camp, then you're not one of mine. Well, count me out. I'm not in anybody's camp. And uh, Brother Dan was telling me about a guy out in Washington. He preached a message about camping, and he says, if you want to see the real wildlife, get out of the campgrounds. And if you want to see what the Lord's really working, get out of the campgrounds and start finding out where the Lord's really working. There's a lot of truth in that. Okay, Second Corinthians. It's an epistle. All of Paul's writings are epistle. That's another uh, word for letter. Okay, how do I know that? Let's try it. Acts chapter 22, I think is where I'm looking for. The Bible would define its own terms, its own words. See if I can locate it here. Acts 23, verse 33. An epistle is another name for letter. It's another word for letter. Acts 23, verse 33. The Bible defines itself, the words. The King James Bible is a very unique book in that it defines its own terms. Acts 23, 33. Who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read, notice the word, the letter, he asked of what province he was. The letter is italicized. Does that mean it's supposed to be there? Uh-huh. Every one of them. Why? Because Jesus Christ said so. So how do you know that? Jesus Christ said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The word word in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3 is italicized. And Jesus Christ quoted it in Matthew 4. So a person has to either say they all stay, they all go. From the Lord's testimony, they all stay. And we can give you about five examples of that when it's italicized in the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament quote. So here the Bible defines itself. Now that's a very easy definition. You can see how that is, epistle and letter. So this is a letter that Paul wrote to a church in Corinth. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul starts all his letters with his name in the front. So there are two questions you ask yourself when you study the Bible. And the two questions are the same two questions that come to your mind subconsciously when you go out to the mailbox. You conscious, subconsciously see and make sure that it's addressed to you. And then you subconsciously look to see who, see who it came from. Two questions. Who's talking? To whom is he talking? So Paul is talking here, and he is talking to the saints in Corinth, verse 1. So this is safe doctrinal ground for a New Testament Christian. Now, catch the word, doctrinal. We can study the Bible from cover to cover spiritually, but doctrine you've got to be very cautious with. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Okay, so there's the recipients of this letter. The saints in Corinth, written by Paul. He starts his letters usually in the same fashion. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll close out every letter with the phrase, Grace be unto you. And I've got a whole message on that, and that's usually the first message that I preach at any church I go to, and that's how to have grace. And grace be unto you, this is so important in the Bible, but when you see things repeated over and over like this in the Bible, you tend to forget or you tend to skip over the meaning. When somebody constantly tries to hammer you with something, I understand that when the news media is trying to get something over on the American people, they constantly hammer you with that topic, just constantly, constantly, constantly. That way you'll get desensitized to it, and that way they'll do what they want. Now, with God, when He constantly hits on something, He does it for emphasis. And so He says, grace be unto you. So we should have grace. But sadly, that is far but lacking. The last verse in your Bible says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Uh, the Apostle Peter starts his first two letters with grace be unto you, and he closes them with grace be unto you. This is a daily grace. This is a, a growth in grace. This is how uh, we walk with Jesus Christ by grace. Now, don't let the grace crowd. Usually, you'll have the grace crowd will say, well, 
we have grace and you could tell we have grace because if you come to our congregation we just love everybody you know they got a fruit here and you know there's another fruit over here and all that stuff and we just love everybody you may love everybody but you don't love God Okay, Titus 2, verse 1 says that the grace of God has appeared to all men. And then it says, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Grace teaches us convictions, standards, holiness. That's what grace teaches. If we believe in grace. And that's what the Lord wants us to do. So he said, grace be unto you. We need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans 12, verse 3 at the cross reference there. In verse 2, by the word grace, you have the letter B. Takes it over Romans 12, verse 3, and that's a daily growth in grace. That's different than salvation by grace. Uh, Titus, or Colossians 2, verse 6, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, that's a pretty easy verse to explain for us because we know we're saved by grace through faith. So how you receive the Lord is how you walk in the Lord. So if we receive the Lord by grace through faith, how do we walk in the Lord? By grace through faith. But how do water dogs receive the Lord? A water dog's got to get dunked in water to get his sins washed away. Okay, if that's how he receives the Lord, how does he walk in the Lord? Scuba deer? It's the only way they can do it. It's really uh, weird, you know. That's already, I'm, you know, I, that I intend to be my concluding comments on a debate that I'm scheduled to have with some water dogs in April, and I'm going to save that verse for last. You know, don a little goggles, you know, put a little snorkel on you. If you're going to get saved by water, we have heard the gurgling sound. Water saves. Water saves. Splash of tidings all around. Water saves. Water saves. And you know, the the sad fact is that's what the majority of professing Christians believe. That's what the Catholics believe, that's what the Mormons believe, that's what the JWs believe, and that's what the Campbellites believe. All believe Acts 2.38. I've had all three or four of those groups confess that to me. So, we need grace in our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, grace and peace. Uh, peace and internal peace. Uh, Isaiah 6 or 26, verse 3 and 4 says, uh, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. There are two different types of peace in the Bible. You have Romans 5, verse 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's having peace with somebody. Now, there's a step up of that, though. Proverbs or Psalm, third time around here. Philippians 4, verse 6. It says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known with, unto God with thanksgiving. And the next verse says, And the peace of God, which passes all the understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's having peace of God. You have peace with God through justification. But you have the peace of God, or in other words, peace like God, or having the peace that God has through prayer and sanctification. When things go wrong down here, God in heaven is not pulling out his hair and saying, I just can't believe those humans are doing that down there. The Lord is not surprised with anything, and neither should we be. And this is having the peace of God. And the way you have peace with God is through salvation, but you have the peace of God is when you uh, live a holy life and separate yourself unto the Lord. So you and the Lord are together. And so we want to have peace. Peace is a byproduct. Uh, Romans 14, it talks about the kingdom of God. Verse 17, it says, For the kingdom of God is not uh, meat and drink, but righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. The average American, uh, and the average human in the world, they're looking for three basic things. No matter what they live, how they live, what they do, they're looking for number one, they're looking for love, they're looking for joy, and they're looking for peace. Those are the first three of the fruit of the Spirit. 
Somebody did a survey at a college campus and they asked the kids, what were they looking for in life? And the number one answer was love. And joy and peace was the second and third answer. Now, a kid gets drunk because he's looking for joy. See? The young generation are looking more for the joy and the older generation is looking more for the peace. Why is that? It's because they were too busy looking for the joy or the fun when they were young and now the ships are coming in and now they want the peace. But both joy and peace are nothing more than byproducts. You don't get them looking for them. Those things are byproducts if you love is put in the right place. When you love God and His Word, He gives you an inner joy and an inner peace that nothing can satisfy. Great peace have they which... Love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. But God loves a book, nothing's going to offend you. That's a promise. Now, that's kind of a joke in our house. If somebody says, you offended me, then immediately here comes that verse. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Several years ago, I had a preacher in this area who was trying to, you know, pull an insurrection on me or something like that. and So, you know, I had a chat with him. And then he says, uh, Brother, did I, did I offend you in any way? And I just smiled. Well, I said, you couldn't offend me if you tried. Well, if I offended you in any way, I would like to apologize for offending you in any way. And I said, nice try. You mean apologize for lying? People just don't want to name things for what they are. And so, uh, you know, that went out a lot like a lead balloon. But uh, the idea is that you just understand these things and the Lord give you peace. Peace in the midst of the storm. And, of course, there's going to be times you're going to fail on that many, many times, especially if you come across a new situation. But uh, Paul writes this, uh, Grace be to you and peace from, our God, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he starts off verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, God of, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Now, notice how he's going to introduce the ministry. Verse 4, tribulation. Verse 4, trouble. Verse 5, sufferings. Verse 6, sufferings. Verse 7, sufferings. Verse 8, trouble. That's the ministry. You see, you stand on a street corner and hold up a Bible verse sign, you know, like we were just doing a little while ago, and you're going to see a teenage boy going by and flash of the horns for the devil. That's the ministry. And then you're going to have an old lady, an old guy go like this, thumbs up. Now, the thumbs up are much fewer than the other sign. <laughs> but that's the ministry. Okay, verse 8, the ministry is pressed out of measure. The ministry is despaired even unto life. The ministry is, verse 9, sentenced unto death. See, that's the ministry. What's, uh, what makes a good ministry? Verse 12, simplicity and godly sincerity. That's what makes a good minister. Simplicity and godly sincerity. Now, when you go through trouble, verse 3 and 4, the reason why you go through trouble is so you can help somebody else out going through the same thing. Now, the great blessing is that we have comfort. Verse 3, all comfort. Verse 4, comforteth us. Verse 4, by the comfort. And when, when you get born again, the Spirit of God comes into your body. And John chapter 14, He's called the Comforter. I don't understand how unsaved people go through a funeral. I, don't, I cannot fathom that. Never to see that person ever again. You know, where a believer in Christ goes to the funeral, at least we know we're going to see him again. It's still hard, but still you're going to see him again. Where the unsaved, they're not going to see him again. And so the comfort comes from the Lord. And it comes from the Lord because He walked this life and He was tempted above all ye that are able. And in all points, like, uh, you know, we've been tempted and 
The Lord's been through this already. And so we come to Him for great comfort and hope. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, it talks about the aged men. And it also talks about the aged women who shall teach the young women. You know, I cannot go up to a, a pregnant woman and say, I understand. I had a kidney stone one time. You know, I didn't have a kidney stone, but you know, if some guy tries to comfort a woman like that, she can just look at him and say, you idiot, what would you name your kidney stone? <laughs> you have to change 2,000 diapers? <laughs> no, the best one who could comfort a young lady going through uh, nine months of uh, carrying a child is a lady who's going through that. And the aged women need to teach young women. They teach them how to love their husband. Why? Because she's been living with a jerk for a long time. So she needs to teach him how to love a husband. <laughs> See? And you've got to teach him how to love their children because you're going to get put out with your kids at times. And so a lady who's gone through that is the greatest teacher to help the young ladies. You know, it's always a joy to me to watch young ladies when they go to my wife and ask questions. That's a great joy to watch that. That's wise on young people's part. It's wise for young people to go to their parents and ask advice about things. See, a wise, I would say a parent, uh, a parent has to talk to their children when they get to a certain age, when they turn 20 or 21, and tell them, okay, now we're same footing now. We're same level. And as much as I'd like to tell you what to do, because I've been doing it for so long, can't do that anymore. And so now it becomes a counselor's position. But you've got to come and ask. And the hardest thing for a, a parent is watch your uh, older children to make these same mistakes that you've probably made and go through some tough times and not interfere and just kind of watch them go through it. That's a hard thing. And the thing is, is you've got to work together on these things and ask for help and comfort and things like that. And so, when we go through troubles and tribulations, verse 3, it says that God of all comfort, He's the ultimate one who can give comfort. I feel totally helpless when I get around people going through tough times. You know, people who lost a, a parent or something in death or going through tough times. I, don't, I, don't, I approach those things very cautiously. I know it's not the words that you say. It's often just that you're there. It's easy to say to somebody, well, you just need to have faith in God, you know, all that stuff. And about the time you say something like that, the devil runs up to the North Star, past the North Star, and says to the throne, goes up to the throne of God and says, hey, can I put on him what I just put on him? Let's see how bold they are now. So you've got to be careful what we say. And the thing is, is to try to give some comfort to folks. And the true comfort comes from God. Look, if you would, in John 15, verse 26. God is the ultimate source of comfort. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. So the Comforter is the author of the Bible. And so the more time you spend in the Word of God, uh, the more uh, chance you become uh, better in your troubles and your trials. John 16, verse 7. Here's the Comforter is mentioned again. John 16, 7. And nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send them unto you. The people in the Old Testament, uh, we know the Spirit of God has been throughout this Bible from cover to cover, but the people in the Old Testament did not know the Holy Ghost as a person. We know He's in there. We know that in Genesis 1, it talks about God making man in our image. A plurality there between the God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Jews doctrinally only knew God the Father. They didn't know Him as Father. They knew Him as the Lord. Our God is one Lord. So here comes the Lord. He shows up and He says, God and I are equal. He said, I and my Father are one. Boy, that threw Him for a loop. 
You know, what are you, a polytheist or something like that? And, of course, they crucified the Lord because of that. Blasphemy, they said. And now the Lord's leaving, and He said, guess what? Somebody else coming. The Holy Ghost. Because of the new birth. The new birth was introduced by Jesus Christ in John chapter 3. And the new birth is uh, became available because of the crucifixion. If a, pun, if a person understands that and realizes that Jesus Christ is the very first person born of God, he's called the firstborn, that tells us that Adam, Eve, Abraham, Noah, Joseph, Isaac, none of those guys were born again. Couldn't have been because Jesus is the first one born of God. And they did not have the permanent indwelling of the Spirit of God like we have. We have some great blessings in the New Testament. And it's because of Calvary. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 and 4, the comfort and the trouble. The trouble you go through is going to help encourage somebody else down the line. Job, as he's in heaven, looking down and reading the book of Job, while he's going through that, he did not understand or realize that he was going to be a great encouragement to somebody 3,000 years later, the people in the tribulation. Looking back on that, now he said, now I understand what's going on. He did not when he was down here. But Job is a great example. And Job said, uh, Job 23.12, he says, Neither have I gone back from thy commandments. I have esteemed thy words more than my necessary food. So Job was a fanatic about the words of God. Even though he didn't have a written copy of anything. God got his words to Job through dreams and visions. So, comfort, verse 3 and 4. Comfort uh, is used three times, four times in verse 4. And even though you go through trouble and tribulation, the Lord will give you comfort. Verse 5, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Sufferings will not be mentioned by Benny Hinn. None of the guys in TV are going to talk about sufferings as a Christian. They don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about the Rolex watches and, you know, the seed faith and all that stuff. The sufferings of Christ. I did a radio broadcast today and I went through some of the sufferings of Christians in um, Saudi Arabia. And those are people I don't want to be standing by at the judgment, that's for certain, because it's going to be rather embarrassing to see somebody who got their head whacked off for Jesus Christ. Peter Hammond told me that when he was here, he's a missionary in Africa. He's not in the camp, but if you don't have a camp, no matter who you can have. But he said one of the entertainment um, things that rich Saudi Arabians like to do, rich Muslims in Saudi Arabia, is they go down to Sudan and they uh, get their fellow Muslims in Sudan, catch a Christian, and then they crucify him. Put him on a cross, nail him on a cross, he or her, whatever they get. And to increase the entertainment, they back off about 100 yards, 200 yards, and they take their gun and they shoot him in the hand, and shoot him in the other hand, and shoot him in the foot, just for entertainment. That's Saudi Arabia. I don't want to be standing by that person the judgment as they suffer for Jesus Christ. America is probably the greatest place to suffer for Jesus Christ in the world. And it's not that I'm looking to get into Fox's Book of Martyrs or anything. It's just that you serve God where you're at. But the people who are really suffering for Christ today, the Christians who are really suffering for Christ, are in Muslim countries. I mean, they're, they'd kill them right and left in Muslim countries. And news media is not going to say a thing about it. And they're suffering for Jesus. And when they suffer for Jesus, they get an extra reward or an inheritance. And in, uh, when they hit the judgment seat, you'll find this in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Romans eight seventeen. 
Romans 8.16 says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If, if, so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Notice the error or inheritance is conditioned upon suffering. And also it's conditioned upon service, Colossians 3.24. And so the sufferings for Christ, the Lord watches and He keeps account. He keeps records. And thank God for His eternal records that He has going on. So the sufferings of Christ, uh, Paul said, abound in us. So our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.6 It says, Whether we be afflicted, See, another thing about the ministry, afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. So there's another part of the ministry that I missed, which we're kind of running through that, is the afflictions. And the afflictions, notice, is for your consolation and salvation. Now, it's not the salvation of their soul, but when people see other people going through tough times, it encourages you, if they can go through those tough times, then, then I can also go through those things. That's an encouragement. The bonds, when Paul was in jail, those bonds encouraged other men. If Paul can go to jail for Christ, then I can go to jail for Christ. Not that I look for it, but yet, if that's what happens, that's what happens. And that you get courage from those things. You encourage other people. You know, when you when somebody, a nominal Christian on a street corner drives by and they see a street preaching, a lot of times that gives them courage. Now, of course, at that moment, they're not going to get out, stop, park, you know, come over there with you at that time. You know, they're a little, you know, it's a new thing to them. But yet you give them courage. That gives them courage where if they say, well, if that person can be a knucklehead like that on a street corner, then I guess I could say something for Jesus. And that's what we want to do. Encourage people to do right. So it's for consolation. Uh, verse 7, our hope of you is steadfast. And that's what you have to be in the ministry. You've got to be steadfast. You have to make your mind up and say to yourself, come hell or high water, I am going to serve God. You know, Noah had to have that attitude. And you've got to be steadfast in what you believe. Back up a few pages to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Actually, just a couple pages. Verse 15. Actually, 1 Corinthians 15, verse, I'm sorry, 57. 57 and 58. The last two verses of chapter 15. He says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, we already got the victory. We're on the winning side. I don't care if you fail in the Christian life, you are going to succeed in the end. See, we're on the winning side with Jesus Christ. We got the victory. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You say, well, what if I help this person out and I put all this time and effort into them and then this person turned their back on Jesus Christ? That was in vain. No, it wasn't. It was not in vain. If what you did was in the Lord, that is not in vain because you're doing what you're doing for God. And so, verse 7, and our hope of you is steadfast. So we need to be steadfast. And then he says, knowing, knowing. Notice that word's all by itself, comma, before and after, knowing. There are times that you are just going to have to take your emotions and pitch them out the window. You're going to have to take your feelings and throw them out the window. And you're going to have to talk to yourself. Now, I know that's a sign of being nuts, talking to yourself, but it's also a sign of being filled with the Spirit of God. You know, they're pretty close. Uh, but Ephesians 5, verse 18, it says, And be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then it says, Speaking to yourselves. Talk to yourself, the Scriptures. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. 
I like that place where Nehemiah, it says that he consulted with himself. Well, that, that's pretty nifty, talking to himself. And you got to tell yourself, that Bible is perfect. This is what I would do to myself a lot of times when I... When I Started uh, studying the Bible, believing viewpoint of the Scriptures, you know, and had to kind of dump some of the fundamentalist thinking. And uh, when I started noticing the the different dispensations in the Bible, I'd say to myself, now that man's a good man. That man's a better man than I am. Why don't he believe that? I didn't add a word. I didn't change a word. I didn't subtract a word. The Bible said what it said to who it said. It's got to be right. Well, that man over there, he's a good man. Why doesn't he believe that? He's got the same Bible I got. He's got the same Savior. He's got the same author of that Bible. Why don't he see that? Several years ago, I went up to this reflexologist up in Hammond, and he had some little technique where he can basically describe your personality and all that stuff. And so he's, you know, tickling my toes, you know. And reflexology doesn't tickle, really. But he was, you know playing with my big toe, my middle toe. I don't know what he was doing. And so I said something about, you know, I gave him my numbers, you know, and he was supposed to be able to tell me what I'm thinking and all that stuff. And so he, he ran through this stuff, and then he, he said, oh, I see, I see what you're like, I see. He says, you believe in something so strongly and so clearly, but you don't understand why other people don't believe that. I said, yeah, you're right. That's exactly right. And I said, I can tell you what I believe, and I don't see why people don't see it. He said, what's that? I said, the perfection of the King James Bible. And he got arguing with me. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, see? It's so clear to me, but it's not to you. And of course, it was a new subject to him, but you start laying that stuff out. If you study that out, why don't they see it? I don't understand that. And so I would talk to myself. And do a checkup. Okay, fella, did you add a word? Nope. Did you change a word? No, I didn't change anything. Is it uh, in the context? Yeah, it sure is. It's got to be right. So you have to know some things. Verse 7, he says, And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing. What do you know? Are you, do you know you're going to heaven? You say, I don't feel like it. Well, neither do I a lot of times. But you know it. The knowledge of Jesus Christ. Do you know this book is perfect? He said, well, I'm not certain about that. Well, you better find out. The Bible is a very logical book. It's a very reasonable thing. And the Lord doesn't want us to have blind faith with something the Lord wants us to check it out. I mean, the Lord said, prove me now herewith. He said, check me out. He said in Isaiah 118, he said, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, you shall be as white as snow. That's reasonable. So you have an opportunity to check this Bible out. You see, the thing is, is people don't want to check it out. An evolutionist, if they're honest, as they study science, they are going to have to come to the conclusion that evolution is not scientific. And if they don't come to that conclusion, I believe they're mentally deranged. I mean, for a guy to think he came from a monkey. Maybe some of them act like it, but you know, the ignorance... Uh, and it's just phenomenal how these people just stick their head in the sand. And so you got to know some things. Verse 7. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. Now the next verse, you got a phrase there. And I'm probably getting close to 45 minutes on that tape. But you got a phrase there that's found seven times in the New Testament. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant. And Paul doesn't want you to ignore this. If you're ignorant, that's not an insult. That just means you ignored something. Okay, now, if you're stupid, okay, that's an insult. Okay, but if someone says you're ignorant, it just means you ignored something. And here's what he doesn't want you and I to ignore. The trouble that's in the ministry. Verse 8. That's what he wants you to know. There, that phrase is seven times in the New Testament. Romans 1, Romans 11, here. Oh, I got them in the margins there. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Peter 3. 
And those are seven areas God does not want you and I to ignore. So verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead. And then so forth. Okay, so we're going to stop there, verse 8, come back to that one next time. So you have any questions or comments that we covered?